She has, she is now the artistic director of the opera laboratory at the Malmö Opera, and she's very has very, very great experience from this field, both as a commissioner and following up the process of commissioning new work, and also as a collaborator, as a librettist with a composer. The word. Maria. Thank you, Ronbjörg. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, is this some? I worked for a long time as, as a freelancing uh, director and librettist and when I got the possibility to work as an uh, artistic director within an opera house, I really wanted to bring some experiences into this work. And uh, Opera Verkstan is an artistic department within an opera house. It's a, not an educational department. But of course we work uh, mostly towards small children, big children and grown-up children. Um, we commissioning, commissioning pieces all the time. Last year we had five brand new operas. And there's no problem within the, this area, in between the opera houses, when we work towards a young audience, to share our pieces. We play them hundreds of times and we give them to each other. So there is no prestige in this. We just want the pieces to reach the children. The, the language of the music is not a problem or whatever, because the story comes to the children. The teachers ask, or the parents, wasn't this kind of music too difficult for you? And the kids can say, there were, there were no music because there was just a dog who was sad or whatever, because the story is coming to you. Um, we, of course, the small format, as you talked about, the small stage, you said, is, is good for you to make experiments. When you put a new opera on a large stage, you have to s succeed all the time. You ask, was it good or was it bad? But in the black box, the experiment is good because it's an ex experiment. You can try, you can test. We also work towards uh, the conservatoires. So the programs of the composers, they have the possibility to make short operas on our stage. As a libertist since the middle of the 80s, I think I once or twice could choose the theme for the opera. It was, of course, the commissioner, the artistic director from the opera house, or perhaps the composer, or perhaps the director, but not the librettist. When I commission operas for Opera Pakistan, I always choose the topic, because it has to go within the programming. It depends on in the rest of the house, Malmö Opera, in the city, what's on the agenda in the schools. So, in order to succeed with the, the work, you have to collaborate all the way. And the feeling when I was a own libertist freelancer, I got the commission, and two years later, and I, I delivered, posted at that time. And, uh, two years later, I was invited to an opera house and could see what I've been working with. Best cases, I liked it. Worst cases, I was, I, I felt really sad. But still, it was staged. What's really a disaster is when a team, a composer, a librettist work with a piece and it's not coming up on a stage. That happens for se several reasons. But that's really a disaster when you've been working with a piece for so long time. But it's almost as bad when it comes to the opening and it's kind of misunderstood. That also happens. So you all talked about the dialogue. I would go further and say, it needs a workshop. We need not only to talk, we need to work with the music, with the text, have readings, workshops, where we test 
the text, the music, the possibilities to, to act and stage. Oh, this is a drama going on <laughs> close to me. <laughs> So the three areas where I think for a li as a libertist we really could develop collaborations and that is to, towards the commissioner to really understand why uh, does the, this opera house want this story, this plot, this theme right now. And um, uh, next year there will be opening for a new opera in, in Umeå huvudstadsåret and for 20 years in the middle of the 80s I had my first opening with an opera by Jonas next year it's, um, it's Lars and Gote and both times the opera house wanted something that came from Norrland uh, an author from that area or it can be that the opera house wants a historical person because it's 100 years since something happened. Or kind of jubilee. So the, the topic, the theme comes from what the opera house needs at that time. And you talked about this risky project making a new opera. Um, we can, can't give any insurance, but perhaps it's about a legend, a famous person at least something can connect uh, within the, the marketing work there. Because in th these discussions in between the, the commissioner and the librettist and composer, we can really see if, if the marketing department uh, understands. We made an opera which was based on Balkan music, but it was presented for the for the citizens in the city, and that's a misunderstanding of the topic. I think the other field is, of course, collaboration between the composer and the librettist, and it can be that we know each other before, but we can be uh, brand new persons for each other. Then we have to learn to know each other. I must know what kind of music do this composer write? What kind of profile? Because the text, the story has to go with the music. And then of course we have to put a lot of questions that we together can answer. Why music to this, to this story? Why music? And we have to find an answer. It can be because the music is the Russians, because music is love, because music is uh, magnetism or whatever. But we have to answer that question together. And then in what way we will tell the story. We also have to agree upon that. And, and somewhere here we also have to, to really think about the staging. And if there is a director, he or she should be involved. Because also as a stage director, I can have the problem what to do with all this music. Why isn't the person saying anything? It's just going on a lot of music. We have to put that question to the composer. Why a lot of music? And on the other hand, how long does it take for a choir to leave the stage or come in again? And that's a really essential question, because there was, I think, in Copenhagen, a performance uh, where the large choir should make an entrance in, like, five bars. The solution was that uh, the stage setting was made of a lot of doors, so that the opera could make a quick entrance. There could be other solutions, but they, has to be done, they have to be done uh, during the, when the composer is working. So that's uh, the three fields that I think we really can develop, not, not just the dialogue, but workshops. And so that's what I wanted to bring in to my work på Opera Verkstaden in Malmö. So when uh, I could commission a piece, then we have workshops all the time, until the de delivery, of course, 
but also afterwards, in order to see if how we fully understood what the, the piece is about and how we can stage it the best way. And I, we have uh, Anna Einarsson here. Last year, we all, I said we had five new compositions. So one of them was uh, P.S. Jag kommer snart hem by Anna Einarsson. Perhaps you can say something afterwards, how we worked together for a long time before we, we, we made the skeleton, which were the libretto, and also afterwards. And that was a, an exciting piece because Anna's music is very reflecting, very poetical. But as many of you say, opera is the drama, what happens first and what then. So we decided to keep her music very strong, strongly and instead move the audience so that every uh, scene of scenery of music could be as in her character. So that was an, a way to find a way to stage a piece out from the composer's character. Uh, next up is Kerstin Persky. She is a librettist, playwright, a uh, novelist also, yeah. and, uh, well, a bit of a lot of lot of things. She's uh, better for many many operas. Okay, uh, I had the, the opportunity to work with different maybe, uh, and but also with the Danish composer and present, present time working with a Japanese composer uh, based in New York, and it's uh, very exciting because I'm writing my first libretto in English, which. Uh, is a very different experience. Um, but although I'm a libertist, I see myself foremost as a play. And why do I say that? Because that really is my approach to opera and how I have looked at it since I've been working with composers in the 90s. And also uh, how I look at the challenges which we're seeing now in the future and which I think opera in all times. I mean, we mentioned these issues uh, before lunch. Many of, many of these issues raised um, the need for uh, dramas, topics that actually uh, are urgent and uh, can move. So although we have to, to learn from tradition, and the question is what should we learn from tradition, I think. Uh, so, for me, opera is theatre, and I think many objectively <laughs> composers here, uh, we just said, Pat Boy Hansen said that opera is mainly music. Uh, uh, but when I say that opera is theatre, it doesn't mean that I don't think there's a difference between the two art forms, opera and theatre. But it means, for me, that the singers are actors who communicate dramatic content on a stage of some sort, so the focus of the essence is the vocal expression. That, is, of course, has a lot of consequences. Um, and I also mean by saying that opera is better, that we're dealing with a dramatic art form and with the now, the now of drama, which is made and comes alive through actions of characters, their motives, their relationships and the situation that is the starting point for that specific drama to take place here and now on stage. And again, of course, there are differences between a drama that is spoken, acted, and one that is sung. But the similarity, I think, is that both the music or, you know, in opera or in dramatic art form has to be motivated due to dramatic needs. There isn't for text's sake, there isn't music for music sake, although they have their own independent eyes from each other. Uh, they're all sort of subjected to dramatic needs. And uh, I think that the drama and its impact on the spectator is at the core of the opera experience. We can never uh, away from that, even if you want to do new forms, new, uh, we don't want to have narratives, so we don't want the narrative to take over. 
uh, but but still, we will never get away from that. That we have actors here on the stage. Having said that, I come to the what I think is a somewhat confusing aspect of contemporary opera, which we also have touched upon before lunch. Which this is an issue where I really would like to have wider discussion, inspire to wider discussion all of us who create operas. And that is related to the fact that opera houses institute mainly play old opera, as I said. Also. <laughs> uh, you were talking about that. Um, and that means exposing the audience to dramas where the sub matters have been conceived during the 19th century, before that, before that. Um, and I think that many of us have heard say, or even we have said ourselves, that uh, the story of this Mozart opera, this Rossini opera, is boring, so not up-to-date um, fashion. But the music is divine, and that's why we uh, see these operas and perform them again and again. So we may go to see contemporary opera, where the subject matter is very compelling, very interesting, very, very important, a political, political conflict, uh, uh, very uh, urgent subject in the contemporary society. We sit through it and we can barely sit through it. <laughs> I mean, because uh, we find it boring, we find uh, it too long, tedious. Uh, uh, it is just a narrative where the music and the, uh, where, where the music is sort of uh, subjugated to the, to the narrative. So, I, what, what I, the point I want to make here is that there is something very specific needed to make a compelling topic into a compelling, compelling opera. And the old opera creators, they knew something about this, which we have lost contact with, to, to a large extent, I think. Uh, they, had, they had a knowledge of something. And this is related to the fact that we, we actually not very skilled at uh, craftsmanship, I think, of, of creating new opera. The dramatic craft of music theater, and this concerns both libertists, I think, and composers. To understand what the libretto is and the, its relationship to the music. That, I think, is the heart of the matter. So to find ways of collaboration between libertists and, co and composers, this remains our challenge as, as creators of opera, again and again. Um, and here we have all, all kinds of obstacles, and some of them have been mentioned here. That, for example, the, the unflexibility of the big institutions, um, that we can't try out things and, and, and we can't, you know, we get these long commissions and we, we see the end result in the best cases two years later. So, so how do we go about this? How do we become better dramatists? And then I'm not just talking about the libertists. How do the composers become better dramatists? Uh, how do we understand each other's craftsmanship in a better way. The libertists have to understand the composer, but the composers also have to understand playwriting. They have to understand the rules of playwriting, which often is not the case. Often they don't. Um, and here I, I really call for education, as some, somebody in the audience said. Again, we have to find... Uh, it, it's great with these kind of workshops which we are doing here. I think, I hope this will uh, we'll get into many interesting discussions this summer and next with people taking part. Uh, but I also think we need something uh, yeah, much more grounded, longer education for opera creation uh, in all the, I mean, in, in all countries that want to make new opera. Um, because we, I think the basic questions are still, still the most compelling and I think you, you, Matthias, mentioned it, that why, why does this drama need to be sung? Why does this story need to be sung? Why do we need music to it in the first place? And many, many 
pieces don't answer that question, I think. And, and how does a libertist imply a music that does not yet exist? And at the same time, give impulses to that music? This is something very sp uh, specific, which you have to learn a lot about how to do and, 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 and try, try out. You know, you, you have to try it, try it by doing it. So improving our collaboration skills, that's sort of what I see as the main issue to create this kind of necessary symbiosis between music and text, which can create these new operas and which can also make uh, compelling topics into new interesting operas, which can uh, touch not only a new audience, but make the old audience interested in new operas. Yeah, that's about what I had to say. Yeah. Next up is Yuri Reinwere from. He's born in. He has quite a cosmopolitan background. He's uh, born in Estonia, lived in Poland then after he was 18, and studied in Helsinki, amongst other at the Sibelius Academy, and uh, currently lives now in uh, in uh, in Berlin since 2005. He, uh, he has an extensive background uh, and very, very uh, interesting background, both from r radio and from uh, write, writing essays and poems, uh, from producing documentaries and all sorts of things like this. And he is a composer who uh, wrote his first opera last year for the Helsinki Opera, Purge, after the award-winning novel by Sophie Oksanen. Uh, that just got now the Svenska Akademins Prize last week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sophie. <laughs> Sophie, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> she <laughs> uh, if you're watching Sophie, we have a live stream. <laughs> Congratulations. Um and uh which was received great acclaim from the in the when it was premiered at the Helsinki Opera. We hope this opera will get the chance to be viewed in other versions also, maybe somewhere else in the world. And he's Yuri is now also working on a new opera commission for the Norwegian opera that will be uh, f uh, 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 premiered next year, 2014, as a jubileum of the constitution uh, in Norway. And uh, this is the topic of Pergint, like we heard earlier, and this is very interesting. And now, yes. words. And I'm also the libertist of Pergint. Yes. yes. He, He's a split personality. He's a libertist <laughs> and composer. Mm. How Wagnerian. If that's all right, <laughs> I ask me to sit down because I've got a terrible cold. And every time I stand up, I get um, an awful cough. So if that's all right, then I sit. Yes, um, my background is also a little bit like split personality because I lived in so many cultures. Uh, I use daily so many languages and also I deal quite powerfully both in music and in literature. Um, it all started kind of very innocently though. Uh, I started doing radio programs and then at the same time, which was very important for me as a composer later, I rarely had the possibility to write small pieces of music. All, everything from some reason what I wrote was minimum 40 minutes. So later when I jumped to opera world, I had some other background which kind of supported me in this field. Uh, somewhere uh, in 2005, I started also writing my own poetry. I was not writing poetry at all before that. Actually, I tended to hate poetry. But then I had um, a conversion and started writing it, and I use it mostly as a part of my music. This was my... A story how I got to write libretti to operas. I had done some other work, some ballets in Germany, and then um, when we started doing Purge, actually we looked for somebody else to write the libretto. But something just didn't match. And then a very good friend of mine, who is also a composer, said, Yuri, I have no idea what you are trying to fool here because you need to write it yourself. And this is where I got the courage to write both the libretto and um, the music. And I did it all almost completely alone. Um, I had no excessive um, 
discussion going on with the Finnish National Opera, for instance, about the libretto, or even with Sophie. Sophie said to me that, yeah, 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 if you have a problem, you have my backup. Um, somehow I didn't have any problems. I emailed her uh, the finished uh, first draft, and she emailed it to me back, said, brilliant, keep it as it is. So <laughs> there was no kind of no need. What I did with Perch, though, uh, was that I really wanted to write an opera. I did not want to write any um, novel uh, somehow squeezed together and put on stage, um, some sort of a run-through through the uh, novel or th theater piece. I really wanted to write an opera, and that was a very different writing. And I needed actually to destroy the whole story of Perch to tiny, tiny molecules, and then those molecules I started rebuilding back again, um, uh, based then on what I considered are the rules of opera language, and this is how uh, eventually the opera uh, Perch um, came to life. It's very different from novel, and it's also somewhat different from it's very different from film, and it's different from the play, and so. We had here some technical problems. Actually, we wanted to show a very small piece of that, but what's the uh, situation? Have a okay, um, actually, we wanted to show the rape scene because it had something to do with a, with, um, with um, a topic I, I want to tell, but... If it works on this computer, we will look at it in the next section. Yeah, exactly. No. But now, just the trailer, um, which is from Finnish National Opera, yes. No sound. No sound? Oh. <laughs> 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 we can just only the trip. No, no sound.
Um, this chapter is the Finnish National Opera by me, and it's, uh, it's largely based on the deportation scene, where the music suddenly turns tonal, or actually is already pre-prepared the tonality of the music, but it just uh, is revealed that it's one of the big scenes which contains only music, so there are no words. And this, um, um, I have no really prepared talk here about why things or anything, but I wrote down uh, here a couple of basics, uh, or kind of like my creed, what I've found out uh, when working libretti and, and watching the, the operas of other composers, both contemporary and, and from the past, and their libretti, what they have been used. And I tend to be this composer foremostly who thinks that the libretto is the secret of the good opera. If the libretto is bad, then no good composer can make it out to be a splendid opera. If the libretto is good and the composer is mediocre, the opera, for me at least, has still some chances to be um, a good masterpiece. Of course, we see and um, perceive the music foremostly when we are in the opera, but it's like um, delicious sauce by a gourmet dinner, uh, there is the secret of actually what is going to happen in the opera. Libretto determines very powerfully how the opera will be. Will it breathe or will it be tense? Um, um, libretto determines the macro level of operas, even musical language. So the rhythm of the music of opera has to be already or at least is in very good operas, generally still already there. Now, writing the libretto has been, for me, also a very different job, because I've been writing uh, almost everything in my life except novels. I have written short stories, but not novels. But writing the libretto is a very, very different writing, at least for me, uh, to all those other uh, forms of writing, because it doesn't live on paper. This is first thing. And the second thing is it lives with a music performed by not actors. And thirdly, I can give, for instance, a very good example. Libretto needs to be as tense as possible. All the other writing is actually, at least for me, then very good when I write first as much as I only can and then start using my scissors, editor's scissors, and then cutting off, cutting off, cutting off until the thing gets better. With libretto, I have discovered, in my case, it doesn't work like this. Libretto needs to be written in the beginning already very tense and only later added on. Uh, because if you start cutting out something from libretto, which is already written very tense, you actually start uh, cutting off the very important roots of the entirety of the work. So, and I think this is the main problem why modern opera um, has problems in the nowadays world, is we lack good libretti. We don't lack so much good composers, we lack good libretti. And, and I... There are exceptions, of course, but still, as a total of the culture, I think the main problems lay in very weak libretto writing culture. Um, this is what I call by librettist work, uh, like how to write without writing. Um, also, how to write so that actually you make your life easy. Let the composer and um, um, stage uh, director and director do most of the work. I wanted actually to show a piece which demonstrated this moment uh, where I used something in Perth where, for instance, in paper there is nothing, almost just some description of what is happening, but all the power is given to the composer and the director to solve it somehow. And this needs to be done. Um, bad libretti are usually awful um, sausages of information and not everything can be said in opera with words or with information. There is nothing worse than an opera which consists of uh, thousands of talking heads which has spit out information every second, but we've seen all of them. Uh, some other 
basic my uh, creed uh, points is I think or tend to think that opera is truly an opera only then when there is a storyline or at least some uh, remnants of a storyline. When there is no storyline, I consider it like um, poetry staged on, um, on music with music or something like this, but not uh, opera. It has to consist all the other basics of um, good drama writing, like there has to be elements of non-linearity and there has to be at least one subplot um, and especially if music is very multi-leveled, then um, without subplots, it, it just dies off. Um, I already mentioned not everything has to be said in words, and librettist needs to know that, and librettist has to write those not said words tacit into the libretto, and this is the high art of writing libretto. All the data, what I consider the data, which is this information, who is whose brother, who is whose sister, uh, what is the time, this needs to be gotten out in first 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. If it goes any longer, um, I, I tend to think that then the audience will already lose the um, uh, interest. Um, it would be great if librettists um, had good um, knowledge of music or has been doing some sort of music because opera uh, stage is so specific and works in such a specific time zone, uh, almost like in this Australian sleep time, that um, the librettist has to have some sort of a touch to this. Another thing what I think all the librettists should have is a course of metallurgy. Because libretto writing is all about making alloys and melting the elements and characters together. So a lot of melting and molten lava skills is something what I also considered. So metallurgy course should be perhaps quite useful. Uh, in fact, um, with Per Günd, I had this problem because Per Günd, the libretto is already finished, but um, the piano score will be finished uh, by the end of this year, so I still add up to the libretto a lot, but the basis version already exists. And writing the Per Günd was, for me, a, an absolute alloy-making uh, from beginning to the end, because the original already cons uh, consists like 40 characters by Ibsen, so it's not possible to tell. So um, my main point is what I think is a problem within the nowadays opera culture is a lack of um, very, very good libretti, and also lack of, for instance, as I think you pointed out already earlier, the lack of comedies, for instance, modern opera, because um, uh, a normal, generic opera goer would really, really, if he goes or she goes to watch something which is modern, it has already in his mind been signed as everybody dies and it's spooky and the world is its end at the end. So good comedies should really, really return to the opera repertoire. Those are kind of my main points, which I wrote out and shared them. Okay. <laughs>